eyes to see what's happening down below. Very busy this morning. Normally, anywhere completely chock a block. When London's traffic grinds to a halt each day, the helpless commuters trapped inside their cars know exactly who to turn to. Those guardians of the sky, the flying eyes. Travel news is big business in the capital and the fight to bring the latest traffic information to our ears is set to get even fiercer. We've done it in the States for 15 years, we're going to do it here, we're going to stick with it, and basically it's war out there. All the top stations in London, if you run down the running order of radio stations in London, they're all served by the AA. We serve more than 50% of the marketplace at the moment. We certainly don't intend to, uh, to give that up. I think there's only room for one dominant player, um, perhaps with one minor player um, alongside. So I think that somebody's going to exit this marketplace within the next 12 months. Three, two, one, mark. And a quick look at the motorways for a Monday evening drive home. We'll check out the M25 first of all. Weighted traffic means it's looking slow, 16 to 70. That's the M40 round towards Maple Cross heading up the hill. The key weapon in the battle for the airwaves is the airborne patrol. Ian Gardner and Alex Ritson scour the highways and byways of London twice daily in an attempt to spot traffic chaos and alert the listeners on the ground to any potential hold-ups. Now down to Pippa. In the rush hours, in the morning and evening rush hours, there are certain main roads that get clogged up, that get really, really chocker. Um, A4, M4, always problems, particularly in the evening. And you know that you can guarantee there's going to be queues in the usual trouble spots. Um, but often we'll hear of an accident, we'll hear of a problem, um, and as soon as we hear of something major, particularly if it's going to affect a busy route, uh, we'll get the appropriate clearance to fly straight to that particular problem, um, fly over it and see exactly which direction it's heading, uh, whether the police are still there, whether the police are diverting traffic, and any, whether any roads are closed. Um, and then we can assess how long it's going to be there for and what sort of problem it's going to cause. Um, and the, the reports will go out as soon as possible after that. But all is not what it seems. The plane is run by Metro Networks from a control room in Centrepoint. In order for the project to be financially viable, the service has to be sold to as many radio stations as possible. But each radio station would like the listener to believe that they have their own plane. So the Metro plane and its occupants have to undergo various changes of identity to achieve this illusion. At the moment we're doing eight radio stations from one plane with a couple of different broadcasters who can use different names for different stations or if they're not in overlapping areas they'll use their own name but maybe on two or three different radio stations. That's the most effective way of utilising the plane. We've got Kiss in the Sky, we've got the Spectrum Spotter, we've got the Starship, there's plenty of different inventive names around there. And we're also an invisible company. The listener should never know about Metro Networks. To all intents and purposes, the guys on the radio station are employed by the radio station. There are, in fact, only a handful of planes up in the sky over London. But the latest edition is not a plane at all. Hovering above London streets, it's the People's Phone helicopter. People's Phone, where talk is cheaper. Well, what a fantastic day. Let's hope it stays like this all week. In a gesture of exuberant one-upmanship, Richard Branson opted for a rather more exotic form of aerial spotting when Virgin FM launched its own travel news service. Jackie King hovers over London's congested traffic routes each morning in the Virgin helicopter. She believes there are distinct advantages to using a helicopter rather than a plane. I think the helicopters are uh, very useful. We can cover um, a lot more ground uh, very quickly. We can actually hover over things that happen uh, rather than perhaps a fixed wing can. Um, we can go straight to the incident, um, take a good look, we can fly lower. Um, I think it's very good to actually have something there as it happens. We can be at an incident within a matter of seconds um, and do live reports. I think it's uh, very helpful to the drivers and I think it's uh, a very good thing to have. The Virgin helicopter spends two hours in the skies over London each morning. 
For the same cost, they could have a plane up in the air all day long. Jackie King actually works for AA Roadwatch, who also provide her with most of the information for the reports. So what's the point of the helicopter? I think the perception is that helicopters are glamorous, they're, uh, they're very exciting. I think sexy is a word that's been used to describe a helicopter. You might struggle with that concept, but, uh, but, but, but that's been said before. And radio in London is becoming far, and more, far more competitive, as indeed are all forms of the media, but radio in particular. And people are trying to position themselves and have something different and have something which is exciting. So, yes, I guess there's an element of showbiz in it. But I think one of the things that you need to bear in mind about Flying Eyes is that when all is said and done, they're a delivery platform. And actually, they're a very expensive delivery platform. But, but what we've found in our experience of gathering traffic information, and we've had contracts with Flying Eyes for many years, where we actually pass information up to be read from the aeroplane. So when you talk about aeroplanes, people think, oh, yeah, well, of course, an aeroplane, great way of uh, passing traffic information. But if you give that a bit more careful thought, there's a limit to what you can see from the sky. In fact, we've just done some research on this subject. And 65% of the people we asked didn't actually believe that the information that they were hearing from the aeroplane was actually being gathered there. So even in the public's mind, there's a question mark about the effectiveness of planes. That doubt is a very valid one. The plane is the last link in a long chain of information sources that make up the actual airborne traffic broadcast heard on the radio. Radio stations that use aircraft uh, around London and other main conurbations in England are using them as a sexy, basically, form of delivery. Uh, they plaster the name all over the aircraft. To the listener, it appears that the aircraft goes all around the city, when in truth it doesn't. It appears to the listener as though the broadcaster is looking out of the window, when in fact, nine times out of ten, the information is being fed up from the ground. There is one story that goes around the industry from time to time about uh, a flying eye broadcaster who was fed some wrong information. Basically, the date was wrong on a press release. And he went fairly big on it and was saying, I'm flying over cones, I'm flying over huge queues and the roadworks hadn't started. And then in the control centre, the phone started ringing and it was soon very, very quickly changed. There have been other instances when the reports have been less than accurate. KISS FM's captain, Alex Ritson, used to bend the odd rule when he worked for a rival travel news operator. I was flying around Kent quite happily, um, looking down at the tra uh, Kent traffic queues, and I was doing reports on three other radio stations, which, uh, surprise, surprise, were not in Kent. They were, in fact, they were nowhere near Kent. One of them was almost 200 miles away from Kent. And so I was you know, happily talking about the A303 past Winchester and making it all up. And so I'd say, well, it's looking a little bit dodgy down there. Uh, but I, I hadn't ever seen it. I'd never actually flown over that part of the road. And another trick we used to do, we used to... Um, uh, have about one and a half hours of the two-hour flight where they couldn't hear what I was saying because we got out of the transmitter range of my transmitter. And uh, so what they used to do is they said, well, Alex, what do you think the traffic will be like um, in an hour and a half? And uh, so I'd say three, two, one, and then they'll do a traffic report that um, would, would be basically just the known trouble spots. And, uh, you know, I'd say, well, it's definitely going to be slow down here and it's looking slow over there. And they'd record it and then they'd play it back into the programme. I mean, no one ever cottoned on to it. I often thought it'd be funny to go and tell the local press, see what they made of it, but I needed the job at the time, so I never did. Stand by, Ian. Yes, yeah, standing by. All the latest on the roads up to Ian Gardner and the Air Patrol. The latest on the roads for the Monday evening drive home will check out uh, the centre of town first of all. Box, so there's been an accident to the east. Airborne spotting is just one of many competing uh, methods employed to keep an eye on London's roads. Travel News is a new joint venture from ITN and Traffic Master. Through the use of the latest technology, they expect to break new ground when they enter the market later this year. Traffic information coming from the roadside will be through the use of technology. Uh, you may, may be aware of traffic master systems of infrared sensors that now cover all the motorways in the UK and an increasing number of trunk roads. Uh, they provide um, immediate and very accurate information directly from the roadside. Um, and they can tell the user such things as uh, where there are areas of congestion, what the average speed of traffic is at that point of congestion, and other useful information in cars. We were open-minded to the use of aircraft for uh, collation of traffic information, um, but really two reasons why we're not using them. First of all, uh, we perceive that they are not a very good source of collating the information in the first place, especially in inclement weather, um, if it's raining or snowing or it's foggy, the plane can't fly, let alone see any traffic, and that's when you really need the information. And the second reason is that we're finding that from an entertainment point of view, a programming point of view, the value of the plane um, is reducing. It's deemed by a lot of people now as being rather passe and therefore the, the value of the plane is 
is disproportionately low compared to the cost of operating it. So it's unlikely that we'll operate aircraft. However, there are other less obvious drawbacks to operating an airborne travel news service. Flying twice a day, you get used to flying fairly rapidly. Obviously in a light aircraft like this, which is um, a twin engine Piper Seneca, uh, you get, it's, it can be quite bumpy because it's such a small aircraft, but you get used to the, used to the flying very rapidly. And uh, although some of our visitors need a sick bag, fortunately, touch wood, fingers crossed, I haven't used one yet. One other story is of a broadcaster on a radio station in the Thames Valley who basically was well known for his love of food and the helicopter pilot one day had to take a decision that he had to tell the broadcaster he was getting too heavy for the helicopter to take off. So the radio station turned it into a positive thing and they started a sponsored diet for the flying eye broadcaster. They eventually slimmed down and the helicopter took off about three months later. The travel news market is now almost as congested as the roads upon which they're reporting. To stay in the game, the travel operator has to convince the radio stations that they have what the listener wants. We actually have some very exciting plans in the pipeline for, for Rowwatch, and uh, I'm confident that the product offering that we have will continue to match the needs of the industry as it goes through this period of change. And uh, yeah, we'll be there. We, we're, we're, uh, we're staying put. It's, like it's going to be a fight for market share, of course, and I think that the company with, with a superior product will win at the end of the day, and we believe that's us. We've taken the best of America and brought it to England. We listen to what the radio station, and therefore the radio station's listener wants. We provide that for the radio station, and therefore we think we have the best service, and will have the best service for a long time to come. As the battle rages on the ground, the eyes up in the sky simply get on with enjoying the job. It is a brilliant job, it really is terrific. Um, it's also a sense of satisfaction helping people uh, get to work in the morning. It's a lovely job in that it's different. You get some great sights and great views. It's nice as well to be able to, to, be able to help and hopefully help, uh, help people to get home in their cars every evening. It's a lot more exciting, obviously, being in the air than uh, working from a studio. I don't know how people uh, think of that from the ground, but I'm sure they uh, find us very secure and reassuring to have us uh, in the air hovering above them. So, for the time being, while ever London's cars continue to clog the capital streets, there will be plenty of good work left to be done by the flying eyes. Andrew Barron, Channel One.